the whole court stirred and murmured. They began to blame themselves severely and to utter fierce threats against the holy archbishop. Several men started to bind themselves together by oath to take swift vengeance of the king's shame. The Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. This is the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. And now, Ask the Expert with Steph. Welcome back, everyone, to the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. I'm your host, Steph Storr, and I can't wait to introduce you to this week's expert. Everybody, please give a warm welcome to historian Dr. Paul Webster to the show today. Hi, Paul. Hi, Steph. Thank you for having me. So, Dr. Webster, your background is very interesting. So before we get started with our topic today, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do? Sure. Um, I'm a lecturer in medieval history at Cardiff University here in the UK, um, and I teach various things and research various things relating to kingship and religion in the Middle Ages, um, including the reign of King John and the relationship between royalty and the cult of St Thomas Becket. Um, and alongside that at Cardiff, I run um, an adult learners progression pathway. It's called Exploring the Past. And it provides a route that allows uh, mature students, adult learners returning to study with a route to coming back into study and to uh, going on to degrees in history, archaeology and religion or combinations of those subjects at Cardiff. What a fun job you have. I love it. Thank you so much. So you're here today with us to go a little bit farther back in history than the Tudor era, um, a little further, more kind of more medieval during Henry II's reign. And if if you know me, you know that although I don't like to play favorites, uh, if we if we ever mention the Empress Matilda or Eleanor of Aquitaine, kind of my ears start to perk up and and I'm committed. So our topic tonight will surely contain some Eleanor snippets. And that's because we are going to talk about the tragedy and the canonization of St. Thomas Becket and ultimately his cult of followers. So for even the most novice of history fans, Beckett's murder is one of those tales that everyone at the very least has has somewhat heard of. The story kind of feels like a movie to me, something made up, but it isn't. And I'm going to let Dr. Webster here take us back to the 1100s. So let's start with who Thomas Beckett was. Can you give us a brief history of maybe his early years? Absolutely, yep. So he's born in around 1120. It's always a little uncertain when some of these figures were born because, you know, at that point they didn't quite attract the attention of the chroniclers. Um, but we think he was born in around 1120. He was born in London um, and he was the son of a London merchant, a man named Gilbert Beckett and his wife Matilda. Um, and they were both originally from Normandy. Um, though actually later on, when we get into the sort of um, 13th century, uh, later legend would claim that Matilda was a Saracen princess and a whole sort of story developed um, around her origins and, and around Beckett's birth. But in reality, he's born in London to, to these two Norman parents and, and indeed the Londoners would later claim him as a saint who protected the city. Um, we don't know a huge amount about his early life, but um, what we can say is that he seems to have had a good schooling. He seems to have gone to some of the sort of, um, I suppose, top educational centres in England and, and possibly also to Paris, though there is a question mark and the medieval writers pick up on this. There is a question mark about whether he was a good scholar. Um, so it may be that um, though he had this good and potentially expensive education, he didn't necessarily um, make the most of every minute of it. Whatever, after that, he enters the household of a Norman baron, a man named Richet de Laigle, um, and Probably in that household, he acquires sorts of you know, equestrian and military skills we would associate with knights. Um, and we think also a love of hunting. Um, and actually, an association with hunting is something that will come up um, at intervals, particularly um, after he's been declared a saint in some of the miracles he's said to have performed. So he's in this household for a bit. He's perhaps um, enjoying some of the finer things in life, but... Maybe his fortunes change and perhaps it's something to do with, with um, a loss of income for, for his father. Or, or, but whatever it is, he, um, he goes down a different route and becomes a clerk. So someone engaged essentially in administrative and written activity. And he, his education must have given him enough to be able to do that. 
and he enters the service service of a merchant who is called Osbert Wheat Denier, um, which I think means Osbert Eightpence. And from there, he enters the. He works for Osbert for a bit, um, but he seem. I, I guess he must be good at it because he 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 goes up in the world, or he he moves through the service of different people, entering the household of a man named Theobald of Beck, who was Archbishop of Canterbury, and and now we're probably in the mid eleven forties. Um, and that brings him into the world of church business. It brings him into interaction with the English church and the interactions of the English church with the crown and with people like the popes. Um, he rises within Theobald's household, so he's still good at what he's doing. Theobald makes him Archdeacon of Canterbury in 1154. Um, and that's a position with authority in relation to church courts and also, I think, which potentially gives him the opportunity to gain a substantial income um, of his own. And it's that then that brings him into the orbit um, much more of the kings of England. Well, that's a nice opening then for us to talk about a particular king of England, Henry II. How did he meet Henry II and the rest of the royal family? It must be through Theobald um, and through the, through the process of you know, being, a, being an increasingly important figure within Theobald's household. And one thing that we do know here is that Theobald was closely involved in the negotiations that brought about the accession of Henry II to the throne, the events at the end of Stephen's reign, um, whereby they sort of negotiated for Henry the, Henry to become the heir to the throne, even though he wasn't um, you know, the son of Stephen. So that's likely to be within that negotiation process how Thomas and Henry would have met or at least come to know of each other. And I don't think we're quite sure how this process works, but very quickly after Henry II became King of England in 1154, um, we can see from the surviving documents, the charters in particular, that Beckett is appearing as a witness in those documents. Um, and he's doing so in the role of King's Chancellor. Um, so somewhere in that sort of negotiation period of 1153 and then 1154, he's he's come to the to the eye of Henry II. And when Henry's become king, he's been Beckett has been the person that Henry promotes um, and, and and wants to have as that key official in royal government. Perhaps it's Theobald pushing that promotion. Perhaps it's also driven by other leading figures within the church. Maybe they're even hoping uh, that by doing that, um, Beckett will be something of a sort of uh, protector of church interests um, at the start of the new reign. So we know that, well, if you know anything really about this story at all, we know that it it ends pretty badly. Yep. But it didn't start out that way. It wasn't, it wasn't shaky um, to begin with. So what was their relationship like when they first met each other and kind of leading up to their downfall? Yep. yep. Um, so, so lots of potential things we can talk about here. But, you know, when Beckett is chancellor, the relationship certainly seems really strong. Um, he's at the heart of royal affairs as chancellor. And there's this kind of outward appearance, at least, of him being the king's friend. Um, and, and some of the commentators talk about um him in exactly those terms as a writer called William Fitzstephen who I'll come back to but he writes that never in Christian times were there two greater friends more of one mind. Um, so he's overseeing the administration of royal government and this is very much under you know, a new king who is keen to restore royal authority um, and I think Henry II very much wants his authority as king to be the sort of focal point of the kingdom. He wants to do all the sorts of things that will get away from the instability of Stephen's reign that will stop people taking power into their own hands. Um, so, so Beckett, as the king's chief official, is really important um, in doing that. Um, and William Fitzstephen, um, who I mentioned before, actually really sums this up really nicely. So I'll just quote from him, I think. Um, relatively briefly, uh, because he gives this lovely description of the role that Beckett has assumed. And he says, Chancellor of England is considered second in rank in the realm only to the king. He holds the other part of the king's seal with which he seals his own orders. 
He has responsibility and care of the king's chapel and maintains whatever vacant archbishoprics, bishoprics, abbacies and baronies fall into the king's hands. Um, so that's you know church appointments um, where, where a, say, an archbishop or a bishop has died and before a new one is appointed. It, it, it's baronies where perhaps the holder is inherit, has, has died and the, the next person to inherit isn't old enough to inherit for themselves. And William Fitzstephen goes on that the Chancellor attends all the King's councils to which he does not even require a summons. He's just there. Um, all documents are sealed by his clerks, the royal seal keepers, and everything is carried out according to his advice. Also, if by God's grace the merits of his life allow it, he will be made archbishop or a bishop before he dies. Um, and interestingly, Fitzstephen adds, that is why the chancellorship cannot be bought, um, suggesting that it's a, a, a role that's appointed on merit. Though, of course, he might be writing that um, because he wants to big up Beckett's merits, you know, looking back from later on. Adding some things to that in terms of what it's in, what, what's involved or some notable aspects that we see of what we see Beckett doing. Um, he he leads a major embassy to the French king's court in 1158. Um, and the intention seems to be, and we have to think about Henry and Thomas acting in kind of together in, in planning this and thinking about what, how, what Beckett will look like um, when he goes to France. Um, but they really create an impression of the wealth and the splendour of the king's court, um, with a sort of idea seeming to be that um, they're wanting people to say, well, if this is what the Chancellor of England looks like, um, then how great and how opulent um, the king himself must be. There's a military role to it, too. Um, we see that Beckett accompanies Henry II on military campaign in 1159. Um, and actually, it looks like he participates on that campaign as well. It may even be Beckett who urges the king to fight on um, against the king of France in that campaign that goes down to the south of France to Toulouse um, in 1159 rather than make terms. But it's it's more than that as well, because the idea of friendship is seen by the way that they appear to be acting hand in glove. It extends to feasting together. It extends to leisure pursuits. It extends to accounts of a certain amount of Henry, I suppose, um, trying to sort of, I, I suppose, make jokes at his friend's expense, uh, if you like. And, and a, a sense of the, I suppose, the camaraderie that the sources at least I'll portray coming across from, from Henry's side. Where does that go wrong? Where How does the rep relationship change? Well, Henry as a king is keen to extend the reach of royal, royal rule and to do it in all areas possible. So he wants the ro royal government, he wants the king's will to be felt in practice as well as in theory. He's thinking about the legal dimension to kingship and to extending the reach of royal authority through courts across the land. And, you know, Beckett as chancellor is in many ways Henry's agent in, in the first few years of pursuing that. Um, and in that context, Henry wants to extend his reach into the church courts. And this is where things start to go wrong. So the deterioration in the relationship comes after the death of, of Theobald of Beck, the Archbishop of Canterbury, in 1161. And at this point, Henry alights on the idea of making Becket Archbishop of Canterbury. And the idea is that Becket will hold both roles. He'll be Chancellor of England and he'll be Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, so, you know, really combining two of the big roles um, within the Kingdom of England. It's not an impossible notion. It's something that elsewhere in the Middle Ages we could see other churchmen manage to combine the role of either bishop and chancellor or indeed of archbishop and chancellor. But it doesn't work in this case. The first sign that it's going to go wrong comes when Becket resigns as chancellor, which he does pretty quickly. And he then comes to oppose Henry's efforts to extend his reach into the church courts and also, you know, Henry is trying to limit the, the ability of members of the English church to appeal to the popes in Rome. And by going against Henry in that way, he basically makes Henry very, very angry. Um, and I think you can argue that once somebody crossed Henry II, they didn't really have a way back into his favour, certainly not without a complete and utter and humiliating climb down. <laughs> 
And it's that set of circumstances that mean that having become Archbishop in 1162, within a couple of years, by the end of 1164, Beckett is in exile in France and he doesn't feel able to return until late 1170. And that, of course, is where we're getting into the circumstances immediately surrounding his death. Well, thank you for bringing us to, well, I don't want to say thank you for bringing us to his death, but that's that's a great set of background information. It's, you know, sometimes you, you don't really think about how long they were friends mm. before everything started to go south. Um, and then obviously their downfall really end about as badly as it can get. So what is your version of not only how he died, I think that we hear all kinds of, of versions of this story. So definitely let's talk about what, you know, what your research has shown actually happened when he, when he died. But why did this happen? There's also a lot of rumors going around about what Henry II may or may not have said to encourage the murder. So let's talk about the surrounding circumstances and then the big ending. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and it's a, re- it's a really difficult set of questions, this, because it is how do we get to this point where the Archbishop of Canterbury is, is struck down in his own cathedral? You know, how does it come to this? This is something that's, I mean, it's not unprecedented. You do see examples in the Middle Ages, but it, it seems pretty astounding that they could let their relationship get to this point. Um, and I suppose one of the questions there that's sometimes asked is whether they're, you know, whether Beckett in particular is, is, an, is an actor in this. You know, is his friendship with Henry staged? Is his defence of the church staged? Um, and it's a very difficult question to answer that, I think. I think maybe what, what you can say is that Beckett... C- comes to be very genuine in his defence of the church. And and perhaps he is someone who sort of tailors his priorities to the roles that he's been given and, and sort of adapts in that way. And perhaps in some ways also, having become the head of the English church from this relatively non-church-like background, um, he's thinking about how he needs to show himself to other bishops, to other leaders within the church, to the monks of Canterbury Cathedral, as someone who will, you know, stand up for the church. Um, and then as, as dispute progresses and as he's in exile in particular, he comes to, um, you know, really, I suppose, entrench his position and, and to some extent to find some of the reasoning behind it in terms of, you know, why he believes the church should stand up to the king. Of course, we've got in tragedy that's on both sides there because Henry is not about to back down um, in in his demands that you know the church should allow royal government to um, to to step in um, into areas which the church sees as, as its own areas of jurisdiction. So, in the immediate context of 1170, you know you've got years of of intransigence, you've got years of ongoing ongoing disputes, failed efforts to broker a settlement, because either Henry or Thomas won't take it through to the final point of agreement. Um, Earlier on in 1170, Henry has decided that he will proceed with the coronation of his eldest son, Henry the Young King, as essentially heir apparent. Um, It's a practice that the French kings have gone in for, crowning the heir in his father's lifetime, um, and Henry wants to do it too. Ideally, he'd want the Archbishop of Canterbury there to perform the ceremony. But Becket is in exile. Eventually, Henry gets fed up with trying to... uh, um, you know, sort out Becket's exile. So he simply has other, the Archbishop of York and other bishops perform the ceremony in Becket's absence. That causes Becket, um, with the Pope's backing, to fire off a whole series of church sanctions. It creates the circumstances where they try to patch up a settlement and where in December 1170, Becket can come back to England. But even then, he does so thundering sanctions at those who were involved in Henry the Young King's coronation, um, including sanctions of, of excommunication. So, you know, essentially casting people out from the fold of the church. And this, of course, gets us to the words that that, that were said. And the, the phrase that comes up here is, uh, um, and it's a later invention, um, is that Henry came out with the line, who will rid me of this turbulent priest? And that he did so in the context of... Uh, 
those sanctions that Beckett had imposed being reported to him by some of the people that they'd been imposed on. That is thought to be a later invention, but equally there is a sense that there was some sort of outburst by the king. And maybe the sources that are much closer to the time um, give us a picture of this. Um, so again, I'll, I'll just quote briefly from a writer called Garnier, Garnier of Pont saint maxence um, who wrote A Life of Beckett. And again, this is posthumous, so, so Garnier is looking back, but he's not looking back from very far after events. Um, and he, he, he puts into Henry II's mouth this speech um, between Henry and his courtiers. A man, the king said to them, who has eaten my bread, who came to my court poor, and I have raised him high, referring there to you know, how Beckett had become chancellor. Um, now he draws up his heel to kick me in the teeth. He has shamed my kin, shamed my realm. The grief goes to my heart and no one has avenged me. Um, and Garnier adds that the whole court stirred and murmured. They began to blame themselves severely and to utter fierce threats against the holy archbishop. Several men started to bind themselves together by oath to take swift vengeance of the king's shame. And I suppose that gives us the, the context that perhaps explains why these four knights find themselves travelling to Canterbury um, and confronting Becket at Canterbury Cathedral, where Becket has only himself recently returned from exile. What did they mean to do? Did, did they set out with, with murder in mind? Did they mean to arrest him? Um, one of the things that you perhaps see running through this is that you know maybe Henry intended to arrest Beckett um, to create some sort of show trial and to find some way of you know um, having him removed from the archbishopric. Do events simply get out of hand? Maybe because Beckett stands up to them when they arrive at Canterbury. It's a really tricky one because the, most of the sources for this are written with the hindsight of Beckett's death and the perception that this was martyrdom, the knowledge that Beckett was declared a saint. Um, so they, many of the writers here are writing with a sense that Thomas anticipated his death and even welcomed it, that he kind of embraced sainthood and they want to set up that sort of picture. What they do, I suppose, give an impression of is a blazing row that took place when the knights came to Canterbury, first within the archbishop's residence and then that sort of continued or was picked up again after the monks took Thomas into the the church into the cathedral church at Canterbury at the time of a service. Um, the knights aren't put off by that. They enter the church and they cut Thomas down. Um, and they cut him down in that part of the cathedral that's now uh, marked by the altar of the sword point um, to refer to the martyrdom. Um, the knights, of course, then essentially run away, um, leaving uh, the monks quite literally to pick up the pieces. Um, and the sort of whole set of ensuing events that, that lead to Beckett being seen as a saint. I, I noticed that you didn't go into much detail about what was actually done to him during this murder, because I think that we have this vision of, um, I mean, that is the top of his head was cut off and it was pretty gruesome what they did to him. It, it and, is. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, and, and now whether or not, Henry's, you know, little speech that he gave was actually suggesting ridding him of life mm. or ridding him of his, you know, stripping him of his titles or whatever it was. It's very hard to believe that their instructions were to do it in the manner in which they did. Um, can you describe the scene a little bit? Or <laughs> everybody get the kids out of the room before we're going to go into this. But yeah, I described the scene a little before we continue. Absolutely. I mean, I mentioned that there was a blazing row. What seems to have happened after that is is the knights perhaps weren't armed at that point, but they went away to put their armour on. Um, so that, you know, that's quite a process, actually, if you think about the way that um, the, the amount of kit involved in arming a medieval knight. So they're putting on their chain mail, they're getting their swords, um, potentially putting on their helmets, that sort of thing. When they come back to the cathedral, they clearly confront Thomas again and the monks are trying to drag Thomas away. But but Thomas stops them and he turns and comes back and and he comes down to, to towards the knights. And, and they are very clearly associating themselves with the king. You know, they are, they, are, they are uttering shouts such as king's men, king's men. 
and saying things like, where is the traitor Thomas? Um, and Beckett comes back down saying, here I am, I'm not a traitor, um, I'm, I'm simply a servant of God. And they move to seize him. One of the monks um, tries to step in and he is pretty much hacked down by one of the knights he, he, and, and he sustains an injury to his arm from, from a sword in doing so. And I think Thomas is trying to sort of continue with the service um, or ostensibly trying to do that. And you can see the way things are going by that point. And I think the sources describe him kneeling in prayer um, and saying that he commends himself to God and to some of the saints. And yes, the knights then strike him. Um, and as you described, they strike him on the head. One of them slices the top of his head off. Um, and one of them um, basically shoves his sword into, Be into the, the top of Beckett's head. This is where it's pretty gruesome um, and, um, you know, bits of Beckett's blood and brains are scattered across the floor of that part of the cathedral church in Canterbury. Um, and another of the sources gives us a phrase along the lines of the knight then saying, um, um, come along, fellow knights, we can leave now. This one isn't getting up again. That is, you know, there's just no remorse or yeah. the, it's it's so much to take in or wrap your head well that's a terrible um, analogy but to wrap your head around <laughs> I guess this you've you've kind of answered my next question because I was I was going to ask now immediately post death what what the reaction was by the by his peers by the royals by the society as a whole obviously these guys are not ashamed of what they've just done but when they go back and people start to find out what happened what is everybody else's reaction? I, th I think you're right. They're not ashamed, but they know. And maybe this goes back to as well so to when you were saying about, you know, what did what did they intend when they came to Canterbury? Um, the knights do not go back to the king's court um, going, look what we've done. Um, I'm, I'm, I hesitate to say that they leg it, but they certainly put considerable distance between themselves at Canterbury. They go to one of um, one of their castles at Knaresborough in Yorkshire. Um, so, you know, that's several hundred miles north um, and eventually penances are imposed upon them involving things like going to the Holy Land and, and a number of them die in the process. Equally, in Canterbury itself, you know, the monks are absolutely petrified by what's happened here and, and who wouldn't be? Um, they're really worried that the knights are going to come back. Um, they're really worried that if they are you know, too public in their burial of, of Beckett, that, um, that people from the crown will be back to, to order that the body is dug up and not put anywhere um, where, where it's sort of in a prominent place, that sort of thing. So they carry out a really hasty burial in the cathedral crypt. Um, and I suppose they do their best to kind of clean up and see what happens. But equally, they have a problem because their church has been um, desecrated um, and blood has been spilled within it. So there is there's a sort of process there by which they have to work their way back to the point of reconsecrating the church so that it can once again hold religious services and welcome the faithful. Some of the sources tell us that when news reaches the king, he shuts himself away um, almost in a form of mourning and won't speak to anybody. It's difficult to know what's going on there because equally we see that the king try, can see that there's a essentially a political storm coming from this um, and tries to ride it out some extent there's a sort of damage limitation exercise launched by Henry and, and, and his followers and Henry goes to Ireland um, relatively soon after this on, on a military campaign and yes maybe it's planned but it's also quite a good way of escaping potential sanctions from being out of the way if pap papal legates should show up um, to find out what's going on or to, to impose sanctions upon him. On, on the other side of, of this you know you've got some you've got an event that is by its very nature, going to send shockwaves across Europe. Um, after a long-running dispute with two very entrenched sides, and Beckett's opponents can make a lot out of his martyrdom. Um, he has a network of supporters. They write extensively on his behalf. Um, I, I mean, you, you could name any number of these. There are about 13 authors who write biographies or collect together sources relating to Beckett and his life and death in the decade to quarter century after his death. 
um, but some perhaps are, are more prominent than others. A man named John of Salisbury is is particularly relevant here. He's been within Beckett's entourage and to, a follower of Beckett. He's also someone who hasn't been afraid to advise Beckett sometimes that really he ought to have backed down. Um, but he sees the sort of way in which Beckett's the circumstances of Beckett's murder can be portrayed as martyrdom and how Beckett in death can in some ways fight for the cause that he stood for in life. Um, and another man who's instrumental here is a man who very much could be described as someone who was zealous in, in Beckett's cause, and that's somebody called Herbert of Bosham, um, who who also writes extensively. But there are others, in, including some of the, the, you know, the writers I've mentioned earlier. Um, and something of a network there as well of contacts that these men have so that they can you know, write letters, send things out. They can begin that sort of process of creating the idea of Beckett as a saint um, so that, you know, his canonization becomes something that people in authority are thinking about. And with the right supporters, that's something they can push a bit further. So this is actually... One of if I if I read this correctly, this was actually one of the quickest sainthoods in history, yep. if not the quickest. What how, tell us about the process and what actually what what did the royals it, did they have anything to do with the process for him in particular, um, and how did that go? Because it was really only three years later. That I that I think he became sainted. Absolutely, he's he's um, he dies in very end of eleven seventy, and he's a saint by uh, February eleven seventy three. Um, that's when Pope Alexander the Third, um, you know, officially pronounces his canonization, and he does that on Ash Wednesday eleven seventy three um, at Segni in in Italy. In a lot of ways, it's, it's it's sainthood by popular demand, I suppose. Uh, you know, it, it ties into the way in which miracles have developed and um, there is a body of material that supports it. But equally, that network has been really important here and some of the supporters that Beckett had in life. Um, so there are requests to the Pope and the Pope is acting. And of course, the Pope has been an active player during the dispute himself. He's met Beckett. At times, he's been active in promoting Beckett's cause. He's the person who's, you know, given Beckett the license that he could impose some of those sentences like excommunication. So the Pope is an interested player in all this. And it is quick. It's um, it's a period when I suppose the sort of process of official canonization can still be quite quick, but even so, this is speedy, and given that it has the Pope's input, that's notable. Later on canonizations will become much slower because they want they start wanting a much bigger body of proof um that, that the person's life and their posthumous miracles are enough to show this i have to just insert a little bit of eleanor in here just because just because i want to um <laughs> so eleanor who is henry's wife where was she in all of this i know that she wasn't you know this kind of wilting flower of a character back then so where was she in, you know, the the relationship at first and then his potential um, statement of, will nobody, you know, re rid me of this turbulent priest yeah. and then the death? What was she kind of standing by his side this whole time or was she going against him and saying, this is all your fault? Like, what was her perspective? She, she certainly wasn't by his side. And, and, and yeah, that actually takes us back to, to the question you asked before that, that I didn't really cover of the sort of royal involvement um, in, in all of this. Um, and maybe we should mention, because um, you mentioned her earlier, the Empress Matilda as well. I mean, I know that by the time Beckett dies, the Empress Matilda um, it, it, is herself dead, but you know, she is someone who's been appealed to during the dispute between Henry and Beckett as someone who might be able to you know, intercede with Henry to kind of, I suppose, from the perspective of Beckett supporters to make Henry see sense. Only comes up a couple of times, so so maybe she wasn't an active, that active a supporter, but it is something they try. Eleanor is a slightly different question because in some ways by this point sort of by about 1168 Eleanor isn't 
certainly isn't actively by Henry the Second's side. And after the birth of John in 1166, um, somewhere around about 1168, um, Henry and Eleanor seem to take the decision that Eleanor will um, essentially head back to Aquitaine and that she'll take Richard with her, um, the son that becomes Richard the Lionheart, and they will rule Aquitaine, Poitou, that area of southwestern France, um, as Richard's potential inheritance for, further down the line. So it's a different sort of way of, of controlling some of the wider territories that Henry II has put together. So at the point of Beckett's murder and, and the events, you know, Henry's outburst and that sort of thing, I, we may well be able to assume that Eleanor's in Aquitaine, where she perhaps becomes more involved here is in the aftermath. Um, and when we get towards 1173, 1174, when Henry's sons go into rebellion against him with Eleanor's support. And actually, that's where we see that kind of royal involvement in relation to Becket as a saint, um, because they haven't been prominent in the declaration of Becket as a saint. Indeed, you know, Henry II has been in many ways trying to conduct a damage limitation exercise. But you wonder if all this creates or reinforces a sense in the mind of a number of people that um, you know, there, is, there are ways in which Henry II's rule could be challenged. And this is something that his sons come to do with Eleanor's backing in 1173-74 in what's known as the Great Rebellion. And in doing that, they seek the support of the King of France, but they also invoke the saints. Um, and in that context, Henry the Young King goes to Canterbury to Becket's tomb um, at a relatively early stage in the cult um, to, 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 to sort of seek, it might even be before Becket is canonised, um, but when he's popularly being venerated as a miracle worker, um, the Young King goes to Canterbury and, and visits the tomb. And of course, Becket had been his tutor. Um, in his earlier years. So there's an interesting association there. So are, you know, is someone like Henry the Young King, perhaps with a bit of pushing from Eleanor, um, trying to create that association of Becket against Henry? Now, back to his canonization, uh, you had mentioned actually the posthumous miracles being kind of a, an important factor in making someone a saint. And if if uh, I read correctly, I had read that kind of a huge wave of miracles happened yep. right after his death. Um, if that's true, do you have any examples of, of things that people had reported? There's, there's an extraordinary range of these. Um, so, yeah, the first miracles were said to have occurred in Canterbury within days Um of of the murder and his death is in you know, late december perhaps by by the very end of the month or early january that the first of these things are being reported they're pretty much always linked to cures of various forms of illness or disability they proliferate very quickly at canterbury and widely beyond canterbury and the early miracles include cures of paralysis um, they include cures of blindness and they're linked to contact with the remains of beckett's blood that have been gathered up following the murder and, and you know that's where um some of the gruesomeness of the murder turns into things that sound, sound actually slightly gross just in terms of um you know contact with some of the sort of fluid remains of beckett mm, well that's that's a nice uh image that's conjured so tell us then since we're talking about the remains and the fluids what is what is this thing that i've heard of called saint thomas's water <sighs> St. Thomas's water is, is exactly what they do with the blood or, or what they're said to have done with the blood. Um, and it's one of the main ways that you might have encountered or heard about the cult. Um, so the idea here is that it was a diluted form of the blood of St. Thomas that was gathered up following his murder. And it, as I say, it has its place from the early miracles, but actually one in five of the miracles that were recorded are linked to, to Beckett water. Um, and I, I should have mentioned before, um, there were two monks of Canterbury Cathedral who were basically, it became their job to talk to the pilgrims coming to the cathedral and to write the miracles down. 
And over a period of a few years, they collected over 400 examples. Um, so one in five of these involving St. Thomas's water is really quite a substantial number. But yeah, there it is. It, it, it's the water of St. Thomas um, and it's it's brought out and in various ways given or sold to pilgrims. Um, and, and I have to say this sounds gross, um, but Henry II apparently even drank some of it on his penitential trip to Canterbury Cathedral in 1174. As the cult developed, I think we have to think about this as something as if it did involve any blood at all. It must have been very, very dilute indeed, um, because the keepers of the shrine at Canterbury came to run a sort of roaring trade, selling little lead ampullae, so files, little containers of this water to pilgrims. Um, and in that way, it gave pilgrims their kind of own little shrine or their own little relic of St. Thomas that they could take home with them. And some of them even had mottos um, kind of um, built into the metalwork um, of them. Phrases like St. Thomas is the best healer of the virtuous sick. Um, interesting parallels and questions there in relation to the sort of centrality of Christ's blood in the ceremony of the mass and what was been, being adapted there. I think that we have now mentioned this, this cult of St. Thomas Beckett at this point. And I think that we, it's important now for kind of the meat of the conversation to know that there's, you know, this increasing kind of following for the saint and um, to not worship him, but to understand kind of who he was and his martyrdom and things like that. And now Henry II is in a place of, I think you even mentioned kind of his penance now. So how do you, how do you think he interacted or engaged with these, with these followers, with this cult that is increasingly growing um, yep. that, uh, you know, taking again, the relics and the shrine and the, the, the water blood. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Um, and, and, and a real sense, I suppose, of, you know, all of this gives Henry a huge problem um, because it, it, he is the one who is being labeled as, as having basically ordered this murder, whether he did or not. Um, so, so what's he going to do? Is he going to, shut it down? Well, he can't shut it down because there's just too many people coming to Canterbury, too many reports of miracles, um, too much going on. Um, and I think you get a sense that the Crown realises that it has to embrace this and it's, it's causing the Crown real problems. They're threatened with sanctions. They're, you know, in the form of the Great Rebellion, we're actually getting active uprising against the King. Um, so, he really goes into damage limitation mode here. He reaches, he does two penances. He does one at Avranche in Normandy in 1172, um, where he um, essentially acknowledges responsibility for what's happened. Um, and he promises various penances in the form of you know, funding or participating in crusading activity, things like that. Actually, he then changes that later on and, and says that he'll found some religious houses instead. Um, but the, what the penance that, that people remember and that gets commented on is when he comes to Canterbury in 1174. And this is in the middle of the uh, so-called Great Rebellion. Um, and what he does in 1174 is he comes to Becket's tomb. He he prays before it. He, I think the image you could consensus is of him sort of prostrating himself before that tomb. He's ceremonially whipped by the monks who are present there. He's generally giving a sort of public impression of, of somebody who recognises their guilt and is engaging in penance. Um, and by coincidence, at the same time, his followers succeed in the north of England in capturing the King of Scots, who has joined the Great Rebellion against Henry. So Henry immediately has this kind of propaganda coup that he could say that right at the moment when I was at Becket's tomb asking for forgiveness, the, one of my major enemies was being captured. Look at this as an example um, of how Beckett is on, really on my side. Now you could see that is quite a coincidence. It is quite a coincidence, and, and you know, talk about luck. Um, really, he there's obvious propaganda value in that, but Henry stays on the case, if you like. Once the rebellion is um, suppressed. He and his son 
Henry the Young King and 1175 come together to Canterbury to visit the tomb again. Uh, and they, I, you know, I talked about how Henry the Young King had been a few years previously. Henry II had been the year before. There's a sense of maybe that being a, a joint pilgrimage in some sort of uh, reconciliation. It could also have been the most awkward father-son trip um, in medieval history, but um, perhaps that's a digression. Um, whatever, Henry doesn't leave it there. So whenever he comes back to England from, from Normandy, for example, later on in the reign, he goes to Canterbury. Um, and it's something that his successors continue. You certainly see his sons doing that as well. Um, when Richard I comes back from his captivity after the Third Crusade, um, he gives the Canterbury Chronicler, Gervais of Canterbury, the impression that um, he goes to Canterbury first. And he basically says um, he wants to come to Canterbury before he goes to any other church in England. But but it, it it goes through to the later Middle Ages as well, and you can see you know later generations of kings still coming to Canterbury, still giving gifts to to Becket's tomb and to the shrine that developed um, um, at Canterbury Cathedral. Well, there was one later king that was not so kind about it, and definitely didn't participate in um, the prayers and things like that. We have we have another king now, much later that actually did label him as a traitor yep. and uh, destroyed the shrine. And well, there's all of the story about that. So I'll let you take it away from here. Let's talk about that. We're, we're, we're talking about Henry VIII here, aren't we? Uh, we sure are. We sure are, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, this is all the things you say, Steph, absolutely. Henry VIII and the, and the divorce that leads to the Reformation and, and in a way, a sort of replay um, of the events of the 1160s down to 1170, that question of who is the superior authority. Um, King... I was actually thinking that while you were talking that that the the feelings behind, I mean, obviously it, it didn't look the same. There was no um, saint being uh, coming out of mm. Henry VIII's Reformation, but but the feelings around it and the discrepancy between the king um, and the church definitely replayed itself. And I was thinking about that while you were talking earlier. So that's a great point too, yeah. that you're able to compare the two situations. Yeah, very much so. And I think, you know, Henry VIII's conception of his own royal authority is very much one that is, doesn't, um, you know, stand for the idea that, that, that there can be an alternative focus. Um, and, and, you know, he very much comes to believe that he can be the, the supreme authority um, and, and that the Pope has no place. Um, in that context, I think, um, Henry VIII really clearly comes simply to, to hate Becket and the idea of Becket and everything that Becket symbolises. Um, and in the context of, of the circumstances that lead to the break with Rome, then that you know, gradually magnifies as you move through certainly the 1530s. Um, and it's really strikingly seen in the way that Henry VIII just tries to sweep away the shrine and, and almost everything associated with Becket. Um, so they take away cartloads of, of materials from Canterbury when, um, when they order the demolition of, of Becket's shrine. And you know, you're thinking about the gifts of three centuries of pilgrims, the things that the, that the monetary gifts of, of three centuries of pilgrims have paid for. Um, around that shrine. Uh, but also you're thinking about a really extensive effort to strike Beckett from out, from the kind of the religious, the monumental, the historical record. Um, so you're thinking about statues being defaced, you're thinking about wall paintings being painted over or changed to being different saints sometimes. Um, you're thinking about Beckett's name being scratched out of manuscripts. Um, you, all sorts of ways in which there's a really clear effort to eradicate him, which didn't entirely work, of course, um, but it does tell you the extent of the orders that, that Henry issued. What do you think the kind of effects or the legacy is now? So from his own time through the Middle Ages up through Henry VIII's time and beyond, what do you think the legacy is and what do you think people should remember and know about Thomas Beckett today? I think it's a legacy that's 
very much about some of these debates coming up and recurring and being replayed in the context of the later centuries that they play out in. Um, and one of the things that's really striking about this is that people often have a perspective as, as to, you know, whether, if you like, Henry II or Beckett was in the right. Um, and that very much plays out in the context of perspectives that, that actually tie into Henry VIII and, and all the ideas surrounding the Reformation. Um, so this debate becomes one in which particular standpoints are taken based around the particular view of the of the Christian faith that people um, adopted in later centuries. So, you know, there is a Protestant view um, of, of this dispute that very much, I suppose, homes in on Henry II and Henry II as a legal king um, and will perhaps you know, favour his standpoint. There's there's an alternative view that's perhaps linked to the um, well the way in which Catholicism survived, but then I suppose the Anglo Catholic revival that has a different place for Beckett. There's also, um, and I think you mentioned at the very beginning, the idea um, of how all of this seemed a bit like a film script. Um, the theatrical element to this that that comes through and is perhaps amplified by some of the way that. The, the debate has developed and that's part of the legacy now as well you know the way that it's taken up in the 19th and the 20th centuries in literature and in theatre first you know things like Eliot's murder in the cathedral the play Beckett by Tennyson and the way particular actors took those those pieces up and Tennyson's Beckett was performed by Henry Irving in the late 19th century he became really bound up in the portrayal of Beckett um, something similar happened to an actor named Robert Spate in the early-ish part of the 20th century. Um, and, and Spate was inspired to write his own biography um, of Beckett. And in the later half of the 20th century, it's seen in film. Um, and it takes us back to that idea that, that you know, Henry II and Beckett were actors playing their parts. And, and that seems to have appealed to the world of theatre and film. Um, but I suppose the other thing I'd say about legacy is that Beckett is still a saint who's remembered today. Um, and I think it's the sort of the nature of that conf conflict and the way it ended and that just sparks interest, um, but which causes people to come back to it. Um, and, you know, we've seen that really quite recently. You know, there were extensive events planned for the 2020 anniversary is the 850th anniversary of the murder itself, the 800th anniversary of when Beckett's remains were put into a new shrine in Canterbury Cathedral. Um, and all that was hampered by the pandemic um, in terms of the events being marked in 2020. Um, but it nevertheless came to include really well attended events at Canterbury Cathedral and a major exhibition at the British Museum. And you, know, whenever something comes up around Beckett, um, people are interested, people come to see what of his relics remains. Um, and I think there's just an enduring appeal to, to this story, to, to I suppose, the, the tragedy of Beckett's death, uh, but also to the sort of arguments about the nature of, of the relationship between politics and religion that um, go with it. Right. And that's, unfortunately, that's something that may not ever be cleared up or, Absolutely. you know, it's, it's not as, I guess, dangerous these days, but there's definitely still the conflict. Yep. So let's now talk about a little bit more just about you. Um, I think that you've done such a great job enlightening us with all the stories and all the information about Thomas Beckett. And we thank you so much for being here. So I want to give you the floor now to kind of plug a little bit of, of your um, activities, or if you have any literature that you want to share with our listeners, now would be a great time. Okay, well, I mean, if, if you want to read more, particularly about sort of early years of the Beckett's cult, Beckett cult, um, you could have a look at um, the, the volume I co-edited with historian Marie-Pierre Gelin, um, which is called The Cult of St. Thomas Beckett in the Plantagenet World, um, circa 1170 to circa 1220. Um, and that looks at various aspects of, of the early cult. Um, it's in paperback, published by Boydell and Brewer. Um, and if you wanted to home in maybe on, on the religious interests of individual kings, and perhaps of a king who also fell into dispute with the church, then, then you could have a look at my book, King John and Religion, um, which is also in paperback with Boydell and Brewer. <laughs> 
Well, thank you so much for joining us, uh, everybody. Again, this is Dr. Paul Webster, and we're so honored to have you on today. Um, you've been so helpful, and we really we'd love to have you back anytime. So, thanks again to um, Dr. Webster for joining us. Thank you, of course, to our listeners. We could not do this without you. Thank you so much for writing in with your questions, and thanks to everyone listening. Um, as always, we always appreciate your support. We hope you'll tune in again next time as we continue to ask our experts all the pressing questions you want answered. And if you love the Tudor's Dynasty podcast and you want to show a little bit more support, please do consider becoming a patron. Um, there you'll not only receive the great content we offer now, but extra insider research, information, prizes, and of course, other exciting opportunities that are only offered by subscribing. So again, thank you, Dr. Webster. And until next time, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.